Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. Phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Some say the advice is worth what you pay for it. Up first, Mark from Maine. Hey, Mark, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, Noah. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you? I'm doing okay. Are you uh, staying nice and warm up in uh, North Dakota? It's been pretty good. You know, there. I remember doing an episode here, like, I think it was last year, and it was something like 40 degrees below zero with the wind chill, and it was, you know, it hurt to breathe. You, know, you walk outside in the air, it hurts your face, and you take a breath in, and it hurts your lungs, and you question why you live here. And so, I mean, you know, we're, you know, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, but that's uh, that's a heat wave for around here. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, I guess that's, that's winter for you. Um, I had a question today about um, update rollbacks on Linux. Okay. So, as you know, in the Windows world, you, have, uh, you, can, you can undo updates if they cause problems. But in Linux, there's no convenient way to, to do the same thing. I mean, go, going through you know, the uh, package manager history and and installing the updates and then installing the last for you know that it's pretty labor intensive for you know what windows has in comparison mm -hmm. i was wondering do you, do you know of any particular methods that would kind of help that process you know, whether whether it be a uh, uh, red hat or ubuntu system uh, what, what what have you come across just for just for rolling back if something goes wrong yeah, I mean, I don't mean like a kernel rollback, mm -hmm. you know, which you can choose from booting. Right, but, right. But, um, you know, uh, things that would be a little bit more at the application or user space level. Sure. You know, things that get updated in that department, which a kernel rollback would not um, be concerned with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's you've got a couple options. So um, the first and, and most obvious, uh, um, I guess the most uh, straightforward solution, I guess we'll call it, is... Uh, is snapshots right so if you were to use either lvm or zfs um, you can create snapshots of your system and you can actually schedule your system to take snapshots as often as every hour and so should you do a software update or make a configuration change that you went oops or deleted a file that you didn't want to or one of those things um, you would simply roll back to the previous snapshot and that would in effect, gets you, you know, the same kind of functionality. In fact, honestly, that is exactly what Windows is doing with their uh, with their Windows recovery option, right? It's essentially taking a delta of the way the system was a week ago or two weeks ago and rolling it back. Um, we absolutely have that capability with either LVM uh, or ZFS. Okay. All right. The the other time for a bonus question. Yeah, absolutely. I just I want to elaborate a little bit more. So the, the, uh, another way that you can do it, right, is the, the what I do. I don't bother with the snapshots because the truth is, anything at the system level, it doesn't take me long to reinstall from scratch. Right, installing the base operating system is like a ten minute deal. Uh, and reinstalling applications is maybe another five minutes on top of that. It's essentially a single script that runs and installs all my stuff. Where the real-time labor-intensive part, where the real laborious part is, is in configuration, right, and user preferences. I don't want to have to re-import my entire Thunderbird profile. I don't want to have to re-go set up all of the fonts and system settings and all the things that I have that make my computer mine. And so the way that I've gone about doing that is uh, backing up my KDE configuration in my home directory, and that will get you a good long way, right, because it's going to back up uh, Firefox, it's going to back up all of your bookmarks and, and contacts, and it's going to back up Thunderbird, and all of those things will, will go inside of your home directory. And so if you have the home directory, like 95% of the stuff that you're going to do is going to be backed up. 
And the nice thing about the backing up the home directory as opposed to a snapshot is it doesn't require you to be using any, any particular operating system or any particular distro or any particular file system. You can do it with any distro you want. And so you can just uh, create a cron job that tarballs up your home directory and stores it somewhere. Um, or you can use a number of different backup utilities like Deja Dupe that provide uh, Delta backups of a given directory. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds. You can roll back your home directory to any time. Now, obviously that's not going to save you if you, uh, you know, if you futzed up your, um, F stab, for example, or something like that. And so in that event, the nice thing about, uh, snapshots is they truly are snapshots of your system. When you roll back to what it was yesterday or before you do an update or something like that, uh, the ability to just roll back is phenomenal. And I personally believe that within a couple of years here, we're going to get to a point where ZFS is going to become uh, the predominant file system on Linux. I think once they get the licensing issues sorted out, as a person who has used X4 and XFS and all of the different file systems to include ButterFS, there is just nothing better. Um, and so when that happens, obviously there are going to be plenty of UI utilities and system integration utilities that crop up that take advantage of ZFS's rollback functionality. And that will probably look a lot like uh, what Apple calls, I think, time shift or time portal or whatever, um, and, uh, and, and the Windows recovery option. But yeah, go for your bonus question. Oh, uh, bonus question. Uh, network hardening for home networks. So... Mm. Um, <sighs> Let me bounce this off you. So changing your DNS settings to, you know, one of those uh, quad nine or, or something similar, um, one thing to, to help help your home network, another thing would be router using, I don't know, like an OpenSense or PFSense versus, you know, some off-the-shelf uh, Netgear or, or whatnot. Uh, aside from... Aside from those, is there anything else that can help harden a home network? Yeah, well, let's um, let's clarify a little bit. You, the PFSense, OpenSense, Microtech, uh, you know, Cisco, any of the big name manufacturers that manufacture routers. Um, certainly, there are reasons to buy them, but most of them are not for security, right? Uh, PFSense, and it might be a bit of a different example because. Um, because it has intrusion detection and, and intrusion uh, uh, prevention uh, built in, or you can uh, you can add it on uh, with Sericata, right? So I mean, there is there, there is something to be said about s some security hardening with with certain firewall distros. That's certainly one route you can go. But for the most part, every firewall is going to do the basic job of saying when I get traffic on any port, uh, go ahead and reject that traffic unless I've been specifically told to pass traffic on a particular port onto the inside of a network. So that's not that's not really where I focus when when I do security consulting um, on on any particular brand or hardware or, or anything like that. What I what we do focus on is if you have that off the shelf Linksys router, how often is it being updated and how often does Linksys release updates? So when something like Heartbleed happens, does the Belkin, uh, you know, whatever go to router that Belkin made a one off thing and basically designed for it to be thrown away after a year or so when it's not in use, it, it, that device is probably not receiving your routine updates like your Microtex would or like your PFSense would or Cisco would uh, or, you know, any of the exactly. any of the large name manufacturers. So, so we, we look at the update schedule and, and how often those are coming. The second thing you'll look at is logging, right? And so if you can get a, a firewall appliance that does uh, more in-depth logging and will tell you how many people have tried to log in and how many times those have been rejected, if it was authenticated, what IP address it came from, what time it came from, those kinds of things, those are advantageous. And then the other thing that we look at when it comes to security is how are you going to get to the inside of the network? Because almost anybody who has devices connected to the internet wants to, it some point access them from outside the network and what you don't get with an off-the-shelf router uh, like Linksys or, or Belkin is integrated VPN technology now that is changing in fact uh, it's changing quickly a lot of the uh, even prosumer routers now come with open VPN bundled and so that's a good thing it's a good step in the right direction but when you're looking at at those off-the-shelf routers one of the things you look at is can I set up some sort of VPN technology so that I can get into the uh, into the network with one uh, single door? I want as few doors open to the network as possible. And so I, I very much disagree with the 
mentality or practice of forwarding ports uh, on the firewall to the inside of the network. I, I mean, uh, uh, unless it's an extreme example, the vast majority of devices that you're forwarding ports to on the inside of the network are usually not things that are designed to be op open to the internet. And I've seen that done in industry so many times um, where various different you know, door controllers, access controllers, alarm systems, uh, heating and air conditioning, um, all these things that are not really wherever designed to be put directly on the Internet are being put on the Internet um, because they're punching holes through the firewall. and We don't see it as the same thing because we think we have this firewall in between. Right. And so I try to draw a lot of attention to those kinds of situations and say, hey, if you want to access this thing from the outside, set up wire guards, set up open VPN, set up L2TP if you want, but set something up so that you're tunneling in into the inside of the network. Um, and then the last thing is make sure that, again, you're collecting those logs, that's great. Make sure somebody is going through them. Make sure you're paying attention to what services are running, what things are, what things are being logged. One thing that I do a lot, anytime we go into a business, um, and they're having any sort of problem, I go and check DNS. I look at, uh, you know, if it's PFSense, log in and see what the DNS resolver, uh, what it's being asked to resolve. And you can look at those host names, and a lot of times when you start seeing things that look a little suspicious, you can Google some of those host names, and you'll find out that some of them are tied to malware and Trojans and those kinds of things, and then it starts to give you an idea where to look in the network, because you can start to say, okay, so this, you know, what what client is trying to ask for this DNS resolution, and then you can focus on that machine and say, hey, I think there's something up. By the way, word to the wise, number one thing that we see is Android and iOS devices that are reaching out for something. They have clicked on a link or, uh, or, or done something. It's most Mobile devices are the thing that we're seeing oftentimes being the threat to a network. And I think a lot of times people don't give a second thought to their kid's iPhone or their kid's Android tablet that they've added to the Internet. I think they try to focus on their computer and, they, and you know, and the, the family computer maybe, and they're, they've totally forgotten about this this Kindle or this Amazon Fire thing that's just hanging out in the open. And, and those things can become infected with malware and they can pose a problem to both homes and businesses. So um, those are some of the things I look at. Does it, does that answer your question, or does that at least give you something to start with? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, what about DNS configuration for home home router? Uh, uh, any particular recommendation? I typically set DNS. Um, I use uh, I use Cloudflare, uh, and it really started as kind of a as kind of a debate on if Cloudflare was actually faster than Google. By the way, it is. Uh, I lost. But I, I, so I, I, I've been using that for a while. I'm really kind of holding out, and we talked about this a little bit on the show a few weeks ago. I'm really kind of holding out for some of the new encrypted DNS technology that is coming around because the truth is, DNS is just not a secure thing. And so if you're trying to, I mean, no matter what DNS provider you're using, um, those requests are going out over the internet and, and your ISP is able to see what domains you're asking for, no matter who you're resolving them, uh, you know, through. So, um, you know, as, as DNS technology advances and we get to a point where DNS can become a completely private thing, I think that will be, that's when I will start to really dig in and say, all right, now I have some really strong preferences on, on how we do DNS. Uh, tip, a typical configuration for us is the there's an internal DNS server of some sort. If it's a, if it's a Windows environment, that almost necessitates that it has to be the act, uh, the domain controller. If it's not a primary Windows environment, then there's either a bind server or it's just being done on the firewall appliance itself. Um, and that has a number of advantages from the standpoint of control and content filtering because. Uh, if the user doesn't have, uh, you know, privileged access to the machine to change their own DNS servers, then by specifying that the router is the first point for resolving addresses, you can redirect undesirable websites to 127.0.0.1, for example. Um, it also creates the ability to do some internal, um, uh, you know, uh, DNS stuff. Yeah, so like, for example, Unify. It, anytime a Unify device comes on the network, the very first thing it does is tries to resolve the host name Unify, which is obviously not a valid, uh, fully qualified domain name, so it won't resolve on the internet. But if you were to specify a local DNS record to either your local controller or a controller that exists on a DigitalOcean droplet, for example, 
uh, then that then those devices will populate in that controller automatically without having to be manually informed. And so there are a number of advantages to having some local control over the DNS inside of the site. Again, the kind of functionality that you'll get with a PFSense or an OpenSense or a Microtech that you won't get with a Linksys or a Belkin. I'm sorry. So Microtech, what are do they? What what is their system that the Microtech devices are running on? You. You kind of allude that it... Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's their own proprietary thing? It is, yeah. So Microtech makes their own uh, makes their own hardware. It, it's ARM-based hardware, I believe. And it um, and it it runs a, a software called Router OS. And there's nothing from a licensing standpoint or open source standpoint that I particularly like. Um, it, it, I mean, it does work fine with Linux. You can SSH in, you can manage the web UI from any operating system. It's it's uh, operating system agnostic, of course. But uh, the thing that I liked about Microtech and the reason that we stuck with them for so long is because they their, their least expensive router comes in at like $35 uh, and they scale all the way up to about $5,000. And there are some major ISPs that are using them uh, and they're very, very popular. In fact, they got their start with wireless ISPs. And the thing that I like about them from a business perspective, Mark, is that I can take these routers, these $25, $35 routers, and give them to all my employees and tell them, take them home, play with them, you own them, I'll just give you one for working here. And then they have the opportunity on their own time to learn that technology. The great thing about that is when they come back into the office, the same web UI, the same technology, the same menu structure, the same functionality, the same feature sets are available on the $3,000 routers that they're working on uh, in, in client locations. Now you could compare that to a certain extent with something like PFSense, which allows you to download the ISO and just run it on your own hardware. And that's great. One of the things that we've constantly run into as a problem with PFSense is there is, there, there is not very, there's not much inexpensive hardware out there pre-bundled with, uh, PFSense. I think the cheapest one that NetGates offers is like $200. Um, and that's fine if you're running a, you know, a, a, a reasonable size business, but if you're a nonprofit or if you're a small church, um, or if you're a, a, a startup, you know, $200 for just the router alone. Um, and then you got to buy an access point on top of that because it doesn't come with Wi-Fi is problematic. And then add to that their they, their rack mount solution is essentially a rubber band that connects to the front of the smallest net gate router and attaches to a rack and it just doesn't look very professional to me and the cheapest rack mount option they have is a thousand dollars um and so in you know in those circumstances we have either looked to the microtech uh, 3011 which is a 1u device that sells for about 200 dollars um and offers very comparable functionality um to to, to pf sense or uh, there are circumstances if they're not doing anything particularly uh, sophisticated with the network that we've been able to get away with the USG and the USG, the rack mount version anyway, sells for, I think, about three hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and so, the, you know, there's there's a wide range of of security appliances that are out there and they all do a bunch of different things. So I'd have a hard time telling you, uh, you know, go with this one over that one. Um, but if you're looking for a place to start, Microtech is a good place to start because they're inexpensive uh, and they scale very well. And PFSense is a great place to start because it is, it's a far more open platform. There's a lot more support for it out there. And uh, you also have the ability to run it virtualized, which is very nice. Another thing that is, uh, again, a point of contention with us and, and NetGate is you, will, you are not allowed to become a, an official uh, PFSense retailer, NetGate retailer, if you support uh, or install virtualized PFSense routers. And I, it just seems silly to me. I mean, we are literally at a point where everything is being virtualized. Why would I not want to virtualize the gateway other than the fact that they lose money if they don't buy the gateway? Um, so I, you know, it's, I wish I had a great answer and you probably tell by the fact that this, this conversation has gone on for five minutes that I'm conflicted and that I would love to have a better answer for these things. Um, but the truth is it's just a very competitive world and there's a lot of really great products and all of them have, you know, advantages and disadvantages. Well, at the end of the day, you know, you've pointed out a, a working system uh, mm -hmm. solution. So sure. that's kind of the style of Linux anyway. <laughs> yeah. Often it's not a pretty, pretty solution, but, you know, it gets the job done. So uh, that works for me. Yeah, I appreciate the call. Thanks. Thanks for calling in. In fact, uh, <laughs> something tells me 
uh, this is going to be a, this is going to be a similar call. Interestingly enough, in I was talking about a DNS. If you'd like to know what Unify's answer to internal DNS is, it's such a and I use this term uh, loosely complicated feature that they can't be bothered to put it into the UI. You have to edit a JSON file in order to get it to work. But you know, someday we'll get around to DNS. Chris, West Virginia, you're on Ask <laughs> Noah. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I knew where that was going just as soon as you started. Right. Yeah. Had nothing to well, do with. Had nothing to do with. I saw your name next on the list. Right. Right. Well, no. Ironically, um, I wanted to get on the Unify soapbox too. If you have the time, I do. Um, I sent you a message a couple weeks ago, and I know you are extremely busy nowadays. Uh, did you know that Unify started phoning home again? They changed it, huh? Well, uh, long and the short of it is uh, there was a controller update to version 5.13.9, and the devices started sending data back to Unify. Uh, you can turn off the personal data in the GUI, uh, uh, and it's just a, a simple, you know, slide this over here, and we'll stop sending data. However, there is still anonymous data being tracked, and you have to create a config.properties file inside the system somewhere and put this long convoluted line uh, that says stop sending anonymous data to and then restart the controller. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's particularly frustrating about this and, and again, why I'm so conflicted because I probably sound like I have a split personality disorder uh, talking about this stuff, but the, here's the truth. So I, I could spend the rest of the episode talking about how infuriating it is that Unify pulls this crap, uh, particularly because their target base audience is people in network security and people that want to own their own hardware. If we didn't, we'd all be using Marikai, right? So, so, that, so, that, so that, that's one side, right? Here's the other side of it, though. I had a client. We had a USG 4 Pro. I'm sorry. They had the regular USG. Traffic couldn't be handled by it. They wanted to go to the Pro. We said, no problem. We brought in the Pro. Uh I walked on site, and let me explain this. For any of you who have not done a gateway exchange before, best case scenario is you export the config from the old router, you install the new router. At this point, the entire site is down. Uh, you log into the new router with the default IP and default credentials. You import the configuration, you restart the router, and again, best case scenario, it comes back up. Worst case scenario, you end up having to tweak, or a pro, I should start, likely scenario, you have to tweak a couple little interfaces because the models didn't exactly match up, and so you have to tell everything where it matches. And worst case scenario is, for whatever reason, the config doesn't import, and you end up having to do it by scratch. Either way, best case scenario, you're looking at like maybe 10 to 15 minutes to do the swap, and worst case scenario, maybe an hour, uh, depending on how complicated the, the, um, you know, the configuration is. Let me explain how the process went with the USG. I logged into the controller and I clicked forget. Then I plugged the USG Pro in and I clicked adopt. And about 41 seconds later, the entire configuration had pulled down to the USG Pro. The site was back online. It reestablished my VPN connection, site to site VPN connection across the city to their other remote office because the controller is aware of both sites, and even though the public IP address had changed because I had not yet put in the static IP address, it figured it out and just, oh, okay, well, here's what we're going to do, and negotiated the connections. And I'm like, man, they're really onto something, you know? Like, as far as IT yeah. providers go, if you want a no-nonsense hassle... Now, again, Unify is aware of how happy I was because I'm sure they got the metrics on how fast their router came back up. But the, the thing is, like... At, as, as, as a managed service provider, though, like there are two sides to this. I have to balance the privacy and flexibility and ownership of technology with the fact that this just works and works well and provides a good experience to the customer. And so I'm constantly balancing those things. And like I said, it makes me sound schizophrenic. You just have to build your own DNS server inside your network. Right, yeah, no problem with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should totally do that for a you know, four-person okay. four trade. Anyway, I, I didn't mean to steal your Unify soapbox. So they're sending data back to oh, a Unify now. There's another one. Okay. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, and, and supposedly you could turn it off. Uh, and there are people who, you know, who watch their routers, and they'll put the USG behind something else, like a, a PFSense. And yeah, I've they seen will that. confirm that it <laughs> stops 
sending the traffic when you put this quote unquote fix in. You know, but but seriously, why why make it so you turn one slider off and you just stop sending my personal network? No data, kidding. But continue to send anonymous analytics, uh, and then and then you have to go in with this. You have to actually create a file. The file doesn't exist. You have to create a text file and put a line in it that says stop sending anonymous analytics. Why do that? Because uh, because here's here's there. why because they they have this they have they operate on the principle that Google and Apple and Nest and and Ring and everybody else operates as long as the data isn't too personal people won't throw that much of a fit. This I think the thing that that Unify in particular is missing though when you're selling Ring cameras, you're selling them to, and I mean this term as nicely as I can possibly mean it, idiots that don't really have any concept of what they're buying or what they're doing. They just plug it in and just expect it to work. And they downloaded the app and the camera feed got from the camera to the app, so they figure that's a success. And that's about as far as they thought into it. Uh, the, the difference with Unify is this entire company, the reason they are as successful as they are is because people like you and me and the rest of the do-it-yourselfers said we want an enterprise device that has enterprise performance and doesn't have an enterprise cost associated with it. And that's what Unify has delivered for the last, I don't know, 10 years. So we it, it's a bunch of people that really like to dig in and play with the stuff. And so the fact that they are assuming that people either won't care or won't notice seems very misguided to me. Well, you know, it's okay to put it in, but don't make me opt out. Let me opt in. And they won't even do that, despite the fact that the entire community on their forums is screaming at Oh, I'm sure. Them. I'm don't sure. When the, when, the initial, when the initial yeah. announcement came out, you could not find a place on Reddit that was talking about networking that where somebody wasn't complaining about Unify that week. Right. So I can only imagine... But that's that's too bad. I you know we've already started to make the shift, and I, I was never a massive fan of of uh, of their routers or switches to begin with. And I know you and I have had numerous conversations about that. But I was a really big fan of their access points, and uh, and so you know we're going to continue to install them for the time being. But uh, as newer technology comes out, as particularly as more open technology comes out, I know we'll be making the right. change at some point. We'll see. Okay, that so so this conversation I, I've got I've actually got two more. Unify. One is a camera. Well, actually, they're both NVRs. Okay. One is new NVR issue and one's old NVR. So, old NVR. Google Chrome version 80 breaks streaming of the video. Yeah, I noticed that. Did it, you? It, well, interestingly enough, fact, interestingly enough, on a client right now. interestingly enough, up till what, a year ago, Firefox wouldn't handle the, the embedded streaming in, so from the old NVR. And uh, you, you had to do a bunch of. It still won't. Well, no, it does. There is a, there is now a fix. There is a, there is a change you make in the about dot config, uh, or about colon config or whatever it is in Firefox that you can. I'll send you the link, and you can change. Yes. Uh, so so that so that it will it will stream the uh, the the feed in the camera thing. And yeah, as of now, now Chrome doesn't work. Although I I suspect well, they will fix that sooner rather than later because there's so many people still using that software. Yes, and turns out it's it's a way that the self signed certificate was created. Unify is aware of it. As of two days ago, they have a script that regenerates it. For some reason, they didn't just post it on the forum. They are mm -hmm. talking about it being in the next uh, uh, Unify video update or VNC. Up wow, help me out here. V NVR update. Uh, so they, they know what they did wrong, and it's not Chrome's fault. I mean, Chrome is trying to be more secure. It's how they built the self-signed certificate. So, Which is stupid in and of itself, because in 2020, why would you not just use a Let's Encrypt certificate? I mean, every manufacturer under the sun now well, that is manufacturing this stuff is coming out. How do I use Let's Encrypt on my local LAN? I don't want my, my, my Unified video up on the cloud. So I guess that's fair, but... Encrypt I, I mean, I, I suppose it's that's fair, but you based on your DNS, they could give you an option, though. They could give you an option of, hey, uh, you know, use a self-signed certificate or uh, go ahead and use a Let's Encrypt because the, there's a there's a lot of people that have those things connected uh, to the Internet. In fact, Unify has right in their guide. You know, I was talking earlier about things that aren't designed to be put on the Internet. This is one of the few things that right in the guide, they tell you what ports to forward and what ports not to forward yeah. and, and how to set it up. So, I mean, they've, they've clearly designed these things to be put on the Internet. I would prefer that clients didn't get a big scary gram that said, 
this site is insecure. Well, hold on a second. This is all well, cameras in my business. I know it is secure. That just says it's not secure because right. it's complicated. Right. So you've deployed some of the uh, the Unify Protect, right? No, no. We uh, we went straight from oh, the original okay. Unify over to the uh, to the Synology with Axis. Oh well, I have a I have a buddy who's has a disabled uh, son at home and. Um, as hard as it is to get someone to care for your child when you're not there, mm-hmm. they had to do it because his parents are his parents and his wife's parents are getting too old to do it. And uh, anyway, so he asked me to install some cameras, mm-hmm. and the simplest thing was Unify Protect with some Wi-Fi cameras because running network in his house was going to be an absolute nightmare. Sure, three cameras uh, and in and, and a, a Unify Access Point and the Unify Protect the Cloud Key Two. I mean, it works great. The app can only work, the Unify Protect app will only work if you tie the cloud key to a Unify account and connect your app to the cloud. I did not go down that route before I installed this, and I am so disappointed that that's the only way to go. The upside, when he's not home, I didn't have to poke any holes in his router. Of course, you know how Unif- or, or, you know how it works. It mm-hmm. calls home, and then it tunnels back. It works great, but the fact that I had to tie the home NVR to the cloud still, and it was too late. I already purchased the hardware. Yeah, I, I mean, here's the thing. I, you know, if in, in defense of Unify with the Protect system, they are just trying to follow uh, industry norms, right? If you look at the way that Nest Cam, Drop Cam, and like all of the other things, they're just, all they're doing is following the industry standard, right? And the, At least they're only storing it, or they're not storing it on the cloud. Well, and my understanding is it doesn't store the video, right? It's just it's just brokering the connection. Oh, yeah. It's, it's just, you have to, yeah, exactly. You have to create a, uh, an account and it brokers a connection. But you can't use the app internally in your house without that brokered connection. So their phones technically go out to Unify and back in. Yeah, this is, th- this, this company needs... Uh, that, that's... Yeah, there's we're we're gonna have to. I uh, I tell you this, Alta Speed Technologies will be taking a different route as soon as possible. This is ridiculous. And then the truth is, we, anybody that has been following Unify has seen this coming for a long ways out, right? I mean, as soon as the our first clue was when they discontinued the self installs of the of the Unify NVR software. Uh, right then and there, we knew we were in trouble, and it's kind of been a downhill slide ever since. By the way, R. Uh, R. Walter in the chat room points out that you can use Let's Encrypt on your LAN. You use the D- DNS challenge feature, which generates a wildcard certificate. And uh, Let's Encrypt.org slash docs slash challenge dash types has more. We'll have that link for everyone in the show notes. Oh, okay. I've just uh, rolled back to Chrome 79 and disabled auto updates, and we'll see where that goes until Unify gets something done. Yeah, let's hope they do. Hey, thanks for the call, man. I appreciate it. It was a good therapy session. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it, too. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 855-450-6624. The email, live at AskNoahShow.com. Joel calls from Georgia. Hey, Joel, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. How's it going, Noah? Hey, I'm doing well. How about yourself? Hanging in there, and hopefully I can bring some uh, relief after that uh, well well. Yeah, given therapy session, uh, Mr. DeLuca. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I call. I, as you may remember, I called in last week with regards to uh, my Ubuntu install, my Ubuntu install issue. And uh, yes, when I installed Budgie earlier, a lot uh, late last week, I it was actually not as hard as I thought it was going to be, and mm-hmm. it actually detect it through. It actually detected my hard, my hard, the hard drive, and I was able to direct it to. The uh, SAT, SAT SSD, uh, the SAT SSD that, uh, that I wanted, and I was able to go through. And also, I selected LVM just so I have that flexibility mm-hmm. uh, to go through that. If I, if I was to install on top of uh, install another distro, uh, I have that flexibility to to resize and do all that. I, I was recommended that that by the community. So let's see where that goes. Uh, if once I have a, once I have an idea. Of what so clarify for this me what what ended up being the problem. I don't know. If it was a. Pro- I think it was just lack of. I think it was just me not going to the next step on the install or something, or maybe hmm. it's the installer and Budgie being different than uh, 
being being different than other install, other Ubuntu uh, derivatives. Um, but but just wouldn't locate that drive. Since I, yeah, yeah. So uh, I just I just went to the next step, and I think I probably panicked before before I uh, <laughs> went went further into the process. So. Um, <laughs> well, cool, man. Yeah, I, you know what? Hey, I yeah. who who complains about easy solutions, right? Yeah, and oh, oh yeah, it's pretty understandable. And while I'm on the topic of Budgie, there's one element in Budgie that I really, really love about it, and that's the rave is that and that's the Raven sidebar. And okay, it's widgets, and specifically the widget that allows you to select your to see and or select your microphone if you if you're plugging in a headset or something onto into your laptop. I was wondering if there was any similar, like, if there was any similar sidebar par- paradigm for any other desktop environment, such as KDE or um, any other, or if there's like a QT based, uh, QT based solution that could uh, that could compensate for that. If I were to like, if I were to switch again to a different DE, or if you knew of any workflow that was similar. I don't know of any sidebar for for audio in in KDE anyway. Um, you know, there's there's obviously there's uh, there's you could search for for various widgets, and I know that like the audio switching and stuff has a widget. Um, but as far as you know, the um, inputs and whatnot, and I'm not sure how we'd how you'd handle that. Although uh, just last week, I learned that uh, I, I Michael Tanell actually taught me how to configure some global shortcuts so I can set keyboard shortcuts. And not only does it mute and unmute the microphone or mute and unmute the speakers and all of that, but it also brings up a, a little on screen display thing that shows what's happening. Uh, and so that's kind of cool. Mm, I would totally like that resource. Uh, did he did he share that in a public post or something like he that? He didn't, but I will. Uh, I'll throw it in the show notes this week, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll throw that in there, and you can reference it that way. I really do appreciate it. Um, also, I got one more thing that that's sure. sort of a query to you. Mm-hmm. Do you think five G is? Do you think five G is total fluff, or yes. do you think it's a? Has a future, and uh, do you think the do you think if there was enough funding and the Pine Phone were to get some sort of interest in it, would they pursue an upgrade path to five G possibly? They might. Here's here's the thing that you have to understand, and and the 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 three G, four G, five G. You have to if you actually go look at the standard for four G. Um, I, I I think it's something like a hundred megabits per second. Uh, is is what the is what the standard calls for. And um, and and one gigabit per second for low mobility communication. The, the 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 issue with it is they never actually reach those standards. And so what they do as a marketing thing is they append the letters LTE, long term evolution. The idea being someday we'll hit there, but it's not quite there yet. And uh, and and then they had LTE advanced and LTE A and IMT advanced. And you know they they come up with all these different marketing ways to be able to say that we never really hit the first standard. So am I excited about the next iteration of the fake standard that we never actually achieved with 4G? No, I'm not. And uh, as as to your question is, will Pine Foam pursue it? I would assume that they would because I think that anybody manufacturing mobile devices will eventually start to pursue the latest wireless standard in in mobile data technology but i don't think the standard really means much uh you know when we have when we when we talk about going from 802.11b to 802.11g that's a big deal we've essentially t- we've we've taken a, a five times increase in speed when we go to to 802.11g to ac you know we've gone uh, essentially twice the speed when you go from 4g lte to 5g and you're sure the little letter on your phone changes but i haven't noticed any significant increase in actual speed speed so to, it just all seems like marketing to me mm, okay yeah although I've, I've seen a lot of things that uh but that's just anecdotal evidence i've like seen some people show like they have data throughput that's a little bit that's a little bit faster and oh i'm sure they're using benchmarks such as such as hd video mm-hmm. like streaming hd video on mobile da- data connection and stuff like that i'm and and also the possibility of having uh, the mobile computing with the recent uh, Qualcomm chips for lap for laptops that are the Qualcomm. The, I'm not sure if you've heard of like the 8CX uh, mm-hmm. chips mm-hmm. or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I that, that I have I I have no doubt that I mean so the again the five G standard calls for I think one to two gigs down right and they have added an, a, a ton of millimeter wave spectrum to get more of uh, more speed so I have no doubt that five G is eventually going to you know is going to offer a faster service and I'm sure if you live in a in a large metropolitan area.
you're probably getting it already. My point is we have not even gotten to a point where the uh, the rest of the United States has achieved 4G. I don't know why we're trying to push to the, to, to the next generation. Uh, secondly, um, if you go actually dig into the GSM standard, and the the Signal 7 protocol, which is used, which cannot be encrypted, and if they ever did try and encrypt it, we would knock entire continents off the connectivity spectrum because they would never be able to afford this infrastructure. We have a lot bigger problems with cellular technology than trying to go from one unachievable standard to the next unachievable standard. Not to mention the amount of frequency spectrum that they are uh, that the cell phone industry is occupying is astronomical, and it makes everything else uh, a problem and a pain. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it seems, uh, again, seems like a big marketing thing to me. Again, 855-450-NO, it's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Man, 43 minutes into the episode, we haven't gotten to a single story. I think this is fantastic. This is what the Ask Noah Show is supposed to be. You, the audience driving the show. Give us a call and let us know. Add your voice to the conversation. So, Plasma 5.18 LTS is out. They have a number of feature improvements, a cleaner notification system, the settings more streamlined. 5.18 also comes with an LTS status. The LTS meaning long-term support. That means that 5.18 is going to be updated and maintained by KDE contributors for the next two years, whereas regular versions are only maintained for about four months. The inside of the newest features, they have the emoji selector. That's right. You heard that correctly. An emoji selector. It literally is always just two keystrokes away. You simply hold the meta key down and press the period and up will pop an emoji selector. And you can select the icon that best represents your current feelings. You can paste that emoji into an email, into Telegram, or even into the terminal which is kind of cool. Again, a global edit mode, which can be activated by right-clicking on the empty area of the desktop and choosing the desktop layout. Now, one of the things that they got rid of that I am so thankful for is the is the desktop toolbox. That's that stupid little hamburger menu in the upper right-hand corner that you inadvertently clicked on a couple of times but never actually wanted. Yeah, they've gotten rid of that. So the global edit bar now appears across the top of the screen and gives you access to widgets, activities, extra workspaces you can set up separately from your regular virtual desktops and the desktop configuration set of options. Also, they've increased better support for GTK applications using client-side decorations. So one of the things that I've noticed and one of the things that originally drew me to KDE was when I tried to employ a dark theme on GNOME, it broke up the wazoo. I had text in Firefox that would be the same color as the background of the text box, so I couldn't actually see the text I was typing. I couldn't see forms I was filling out. It was an unmitigated disaster. Um, with the Breeze Dark theme and KDE, that has not been the case, and it's getting even better. Uh, Audacity has never looked better. If you turn Audacity Dark Mode on and then uh, open it up inside of KDE with the GTK application Dark Mode Breeze theme on, it looks fantastic. They've made that even better. These applications now show proper shaders. They resize areas of them, and the GTK apps now automatically inherit plasma settings for fonts, icons, mouse cursors, and a lot more. Uh also, there is a new night feature. If you've ever used Redshift, which is the little light bulb that kind of gives it your, your screen a slightly amber hue uh, towards the end of the night, I find it makes the abil my ability to work on the machine much later at night much more pleasant. Guess what? They've included that now. There is a system tray widget that allows you to toggle the night color feature. You can also configure a keyboard shortcut to turn on the night color as well as the do not disturb modes. Um, in the user uh, feedback setting, now it's important to note that these are disabled by default to protect your privacy, unlike Windows 10 or apparently Unify, they're not calling home. Um, they're going to keep those off, but if you choose to turn them on, the important thing to understand is they are not going to transmit any personally identifiable information and it will allow the Kubuntu and KDE developers uh, a better access and and better understanding of what is working, not working, where they need to spend their time. So, of course, we'd encourage you to do that to responsible companies that turn these things off by default. Uh, Flatpak portal support comes. And one thing I thought I'd mention, a lot of users are reporting that the meta key, also known as the Windows key, is broken. The feature was added as default as Plasma 5.8, but if it's not working, what you need to do is make sure that your quote-unquote start menu or the, the start menu widget has a global shortcut like Alt F1 set. Now, you can assign it directly to Meta, but it will open with Meta if any other shortcut is assigned to it. So right-click on the KDE icon, click Application Menu Settings, go to Keyboard Shortcuts tab, and then Shortcut Alt F1. 
If you're having problems with that, we'd suggest you do that. Uh, Core OS is reaching EOL on May 26, 2020. Core OS Container Linux will reach its end of life and will no longer receive updates. They strongly encourage users to begin migrating their workloads to another operating system as soon as possible. Some options might include something like Fedora Core OS, which is the official success for, to Core OS Container Linux. Fedora Core OS is a new Fedora edition built specifically for running containerized workloads securely at scale. Uh, you should be aware that Fedora Core OS cannot currently replace Container Linux for all use cases. If it does not yet include native support for Azure, DigitalOcean, GEC, GCE, Vagrant, or the Container Linux community supported platforms. The RKT Container Runtime is also not included, so you should be aware of that. Fedora Core OS provides a best effort stability, which may occasionally include regressions or breaking changes for some use cases or some workloads. So if Fedora Core OS doesn't meet your needs, you might consider Flatcar Container Linux, which is a fork of Core OS Container Linux. And of course, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, which includes RHEL Core OS as an integral component. Now, one other thing I came across this week, this came across, came to me in, in, in way of our interactive telegram group. You can find your interactive telegram group by going to telegram.asknoahshow.com. It is the largest telegram Linux community out there. We invite you to join it. There's a bunch of interesting active discussion. People are talking, uh, there's questions that are getting answered. So please join us today. And that's, I'm in there all week. Um, so feel free to come in, say hello, ask your questions, those kinds of things. Home assistant came up in there this week. Home assistant has no interest in F droid. Um, there was a post and a request to pull uh, the Home Assistant Android app into F-Droid, and the answer was, thanks for the reply, but we have no interest in maintaining a, bra a branch of the app that doesn't depend on any proprietary services. Now, this started um, when, th when a user said, you know, is this something that you would be interested in doing? And they said, and the one of the developers from uh, I believe it was Home Assistant said, while we're not using the Google Play services right now, we plan on doing so when we add location tracking and push notifications. Also, F-Droid already has a Home Assistant app that uses our logo and name while not being allowed. The listing has been made without the knowledge of the author of the app. I complained to F-Droid over two years ago, including a follow-up. They never took any action. So, nah, even if we could, I wouldn't be interested in publishing our app there. So, hey, the app, the 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 uh, people that published it on F-Droid responded and said, hey, this got to our this got our attention, and we're very sorry for any of the trouble that F-Droid app listing has caused you. Um, you contacted us. We rebranded most of the app. We changed the name, made it obvious in the repo that the app was unofficial, and even did some work on a new icon. But unfortunately, they didn't implement anymore. And he said, I'm really sorry, and since the app is mostly abandoned anyway, I'll go ahead and have it removed from the F uh, F-Droid to make space for the official one if and when you decide to do it, even if not. Hey, we just don't want to be the problem. We just want to work with you and, and it'd be a soft landing spot should you decide to do that. And then he updated and said, seems like the one published to F-Droid wasn't him, so still completely his fault, or not completely his fault, but he shouldn't have picked that name. And he then falls up again, says, hey, I just requested that the app be removed from the F-Droid store, follow the progress here, and gives a link. Um, so the response back was, yeah, thanks, we're just not going to do that. So take that to mean what you will. Um, I would still argue that Home Assistant is a far better alternative than any proprietary option out there. We've recommended it here on the show. I have it running at my house. Um, I have nothing against the project. I think it's great. It's disappointing. It is frustrating that they don't take F-Droid seriously and that a group of people who are using their product specifically to get away from large companies like Google and Apple, um, they have no interest in maintaining an application on a store that isn't tied to Google Play services. So that's obviously a poor decision on their part um, and I think reflects poorly on their values, but that's my opinion. And uh, I still appreciate the hard work that they've done, and I still think it's the best option out there, uh, even uh, even when you look at something like Open uh, Open Home Assistant or whatever the the alternative is. Um, I I just think Home Assistant is much easier and straightforward to get up and running. Hey, I want to talk to you about some news. I alluded to this last week. I have had a hard time keeping my mouth shut the entire episode. 
We have been getting more traffic than we ever thought possible over at LinuxDelta.com. So a huge thanks to Kapavik and the rest of the development team for that resource. And of course, thank you to you, the community, and everybody who submitted a review, read a review, promoted a review, uh, looked at a review, used a review for something. I have found that the things I have learned from LinuxDelta.com uh, have been incredible. I am going to give OpenSUSE a spin, not because it's anything I've ever been drawn to in the past, but because it is the number one rated desktop operating system on linuxdelta.com and that says something because there are literally thousands of people that are visiting that site and so we're, we're going to continue to grow and expand that site and many of the things that we want to do um, will encompass the community but the one of the things that i think is so important about this show and linux delta is uh, it's primarily comprised of people who want to share information about uh about learning and or troubleshooting and how to guides and videos have always been difficult because they basically require constant updating if i release a how-to video or a how-to guide on how to install something on one particular version when the next version of ubuntu comes out obviously things are going to tweak a little bit and if there's not if updates aren't made to that then those guides become outdated and how many times have you followed a tutorial only to get to a one place and then it doesn't work. And so you go out and look for a different tutorial, but now you're halfway through. And so you got to cut a piecemeal together and eventually you get it to work. But now you've used five different guides to get your server to work. And so if you ever had to go back and do it a second time, it's, it's just going to be a pain. How many of you have seen a tutorial written with a, just an outright glaring error? And you look at it and you go, well, that's not going to work because they left the, you know, the dollar sign in, you know, when they were trying to signify the, the, the bash shell or something. And that, that's why that thing's not working. You go and correct it. And it's fine. But now the next person that finds it still has that problem. How many times do you do a Google search and find the answer to a technical problem because there isn't one place that you can deposit all of the information and go back and reference it? I've said numerous times on this program, the very first thing I do after I get a particular piece of software working is I blow it away and I do it all over again from scratch because if you can't set it up right after you got it working the first time, there is no way that you're going to be able to do it in four or five, six years when it breaks or when you have to move it to another box. Those are what I call magic scripts or magic installs, and I hate them. The way that I make that work, meticulous notes on every single step I do. Monkey see, monkey do, step by step, copy and paste, practically a script. If you follow any of my documentation, you need not understand what each command does. You just have to follow the order and you will get a working box at the end because that's how I write my documentation. And anybody who has ever worked for me learns sooner or later at some great frustration to them. That's how I expect them to write documentation. I don't want to have to think. I don't want to have to go look. I don't want to have to go to external resources. I just want to do. And it has made our internal company knowledge base an incredible resource to the point that I've had techs leave and they they call me up and say, hey, could I keep my access to the knowledge base because I use it so much just in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and so we've looked at countless ways of how we can make that whole knowledge base public. And the issue is it's written with a bunch of shorthand and acronyms that really only mean something if you work at AltaSpeed, unless we've intentionally tried to publish uh, parts of those guides. So it doesn't really work. Um, and But we've wanted a way for a long time to share that information. The other thing is we get people that call into this show and they ask a question. And then for the next week, I get emails about how that person can fix that thing. And so we need some way to connect the problems with the solution. And so we're introducing the Linux Delta Wiki, wiki.linuxdelta.com. We are going to publish all of the resources that we talk about on this show. Every how-to guides, when we have software packages, when we do software spotlights, when we talk about uh, tips and tricks, when we talk about troubleshooting stuff, all of those things are going to get published over to the wiki. Now, the great thing about a wiki is you can edit it. So if you go over to wiki.linuxdelta.com and you click on, for example, our YubiKey guide, one of the most popular guides that we've ever done, one of the most popular how-tos I've ever done, I still get questions on it today, even though we released it two, three years ago. People still ask about how to get PKCS11 working with YubiKey, or with YubiKeys to authenticate SSH. Um, on Linux. And so we have written that guide and I will keep that up to date. Again, there are some people that say, well, I couldn't get it to work. I promise you, if you follow the system requirements and follow step by step what we have outlined in that guide, I promise you, you are going to get to uh, to to success. 
Um, and so the we have a, a number of guides that we're launching with. I am paying our employees at AltaSpeed. When they do something for a client, they are getting paid extra to go through and make the documentation. I shouldn't say they're getting paid extra because they were doing it anyway. But instead of publishing it to our internal company knowledge base, they are going to follow a template and they are going to publish to wiki.linuxdelta.com. So all of the work that we do at AltaSpeed and all of you who are listeners of the show and have reached out to us and paid us to do something or other for you – understand that that work is now going to get incorporated and be given back to the community. So when we solve a problem for you, everybody in the community has access to that solution and can see the way that we did it. And as you, if a community member, if you find a way to set something up or there's something that you say, hey, this is really cool and I want to do this, by all means, please go over to wiki.linuxdelta.com, register for an account, create a guide and show us uh, what we can do right now, we have the YubiKey guide for Linux. We have how to set up Kodi MD, the markdown editor that works in the web browser that we talk about all the time. I probably get five to 10 emails a week. Somebody asking me, how do I set that up? Uh, self-hosted uh, VS Code server is on there. How to set up Libvirt. You can turn a regular CentOS installation into a hosted virtual environment in just a couple of seconds with a few commands. Uh, we have how to set up WireGuard, how to set up C file server. Um, so there's a lot of different things that are that we're going to launch with, um, but we're hoping that you, the community, can help us build the site. So go over to wiki.linuxdelta.com and submit something today. Next week is going to be a pre-recorded episode because uh, I have to be on site doing some remote engineering for my other job over at the radio station, um, but we will cover our how to configure uh, KDE uh, episode then and uh, the, the following week I will give away uh, either some Raspberry Pis or some Amazon gift cards to uh, anyone that that submits a guide we'll have a drawing and, and give some stuff away to thank you we'll see you next week <laughs>